Okay, well, welcome to Roots of Reality Experiences. Today I'm joined by Dr. Julia Bugner, who is a professor of anatomy, physiology, and pharmacology at the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Bugner's research covers primate biology and evolution with a focus on primate craniofacial evolution and development. Finally, she is also an author of various articles and books. So Dr. Bugner, thanks for coming on today. Thanks, Ben, and please feel free to call me Julia. <laughs> All right. So where did you first get interested in primate evolution? I first got, the, the spark was lit when I was an undergraduate student. And I was interested in, always interested in dinosaurs and paleontology. And then I just realized that the, the geology aspect of it wasn't for me. And instead, I, I had this great conversation with a counselor who said, well, why don't you talk to this biological anthropologist uh, if you're kind of interested in that stuff. And I did, and I basically just spoke with people and learned about more about the field of anthropology, did an Anthro 101 course, was smitten, and then just kind of moved on from there until I found my curiosity about uh, human faces and teeth and jaws and how they they evolve and develop. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, biological anthropology, especially, that's a really interesting field because it encompasses so many different things you get the science aspects uh but you also get the the focus on like human evolution but and there's like dna involved and a lot of really neat aspects i know when i was in college that was one of the the fields i was really interested in um there's just so much going on i was really interested in like the uh like things like the genographic project um and and all the different dna testing that was going on to try to learn more about human origins and so yeah, that's interesting. So now your focus is on, as you mentioned, you know, faces and the jaw. How have primate faces generally changed over time? Primates are sort of like dogs in a way. And in fact, uh, si anthropologists and other scientists will use dogs to model changes, like the genetics huh. of changes in faces. Because if you think of dogs, right, you can think of a breed like a bulldog that's really got a flat face and has its teeth are kind of crowded into this tiny flat face. Then you can think of something like, I don't know, like a border collie, something that has a much longer face or a Doberman with this really, really long face. And and still its teeth fit inside of that really long projecting <laughs> jaw, right? So yeah. like <laughs> there's this amazing variation. And we see that in primates. We see baboons, for example, have this very long face with quite long teeth. So they have what we just, in science terms, call prog a prognathic jaw. And then we have us as humans. We, we're kind of, well, I don't say we're like the bulldogs of the primate world, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we have very flat faces, relatively speaking. And there's, there's other non-human primates that also have pretty flat faces too. So there's this amazing variation in the length of, of a primate face and the shape of its skull, and yet everything fits together, everything works the way it needs to. And so that, for me, is a fascinating observation and begs the question, well, how? How does everything fit together and work together despite all these different looking monkeys and apes and, and us? So yeah, that that's really interesting. And what exactly would you say then are the primary causes of this variation? And do we see this beyond dogs and and you know primates, or is this is this spread out you know, throughout the animal kingdom, for example? Or I think it is. I I mean I'm not a specialist in a lot of other kinds of mammals, but certainly if you think across different looking mammals, like uh, you know uh, wildcats, like tigers and and lions and um, there's variation in them. Then you think of, uh, I don't know, like a dolphin skull or an elephant skull or yeah, saber tooth cats are amazing. If you ever get a chance to look at a saber tooth cat skull, obviously these things are not around today, which is good for humans, right? right? right. <laughs> You're in trouble. But, but it, the faces show so much variation. And with elephants, if you see an elephant skull, it all, it doesn't look like an elephant. You never know. You were looking at yeah. it and it has these giant tusks that are really incisors. That are growing out and saber-toothed cats are these ginormous canines where the roots actually go back into what would be the forehead of the cat like they're, they're just these massive uh, spikes almost that are in the, in the skull and coming out through the mouth 
So I think there is a lot of variation across all mammals for sure, if not other vertebrate animals. Yeah, it reminds me of like when uh, my background's in ancient history and, and thinking about when like there have been some articles like discussing about like how um, some ancient societies reacted to seeing, you know, fossils and, and skulls of, you know, prehistoric creatures and, and wondering like, what on earth is this? Um, you know, because it's hard to picture, you know, what something looks like just based on the skull if you have no training and, and you know, what you're looking at. Um, so it is amazing to see how, yeah, when you get all the, the skin and muscles on something that, that it can look very different than what the, the skeleton just looks like. Um, now, how has the human jaw, because I know you focus a lot on the human jaw, how, how much has that changed due to evolution over time? It, it's changed quite a bit. I mean, not, okay, everything's relative, right? So, I mean, right. if we're going to compare across mammals, then it hasn't maybe changed that much. But if you just look within the last five to six million years of our fossil relations, including our ancestors up until modern humans today, then it has changed noticeably. And the general trend is that we've gone from bigger and more robust jaw bones with big teeth in them, especially big molars, to relatively what we call gracile mandibles and upper jaw bones with pretty small teeth in them, um, almost hilariously small compared to relations of ours from about three million years ago, where one of our molars, or sorry, three of our molars might be one of theirs, that, that kind That's, of a thing. Wow, okay, yeah, yeah. big difference then. <laughs> Indeed. Now, I guess the, the popular topic when it comes to, you know, people's mouths and thinking of their teeth and jaw is just wisdom teeth because it's something that, you know, has uh, is kind of now become a popular thing. It's almost, I feel like it's become uh, kind of mainstream now to think about wisdom teeth in, in modern society. So how long have wisdom teeth sort of been this type of issue uh, in the human species, you know, how long ago was it that our jaws were big enough to, you know, consistently be able to have wisdom teeth without having, you know, potential problems pop up? It's an excellent question. And I don't think we have to go back very far at all because, okay, okay so just think like how many of us have grandparents who, who had their wisdom teeth out or even parents who had their wisdom teeth out? Like, did, did your parents or grandparents have them out? Um, yeah. I think, no. I don't think any of my family members have actually gotten them out. <laughs> At least and, and in my immediate family, yeah. Right, right. And do you mind if I ask, have you had yours out? I have not had mine out. I've, I've oh. had dentists talk to me about it. Um, but I was kind of, I got mixed signals, let me put it that way, in terms of what people think about it. It seemed... Uh, a little too subjective for comfort uh, when talking to different people. And I was like, okay, well, I'm probably just not going to uh, volunteer myself for surgery quite yet. <laughs> let's let's uh, take some more time. But it's interesting. Have, have you had yours out? I did. I okay. had all four of mine taken out. And so the, the surgeon looked at my x-rays and saw that my molars, my third molars were tilted in a certain way and said, well, you know, they're on course for crushing mm -hmm. into your second molars and we need to take them out. Okay. Um, so that's what we did. Um, although I, I'm, a, I'm a science nerd, right? So I kept my wisdom teeth and I have them in a little jar in a cabinet oh, no. as you do, right? Yeah, and there you go. That's what everyone does, I think, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I looked at them and I actually, they were really uh, in the younger end of developing. These teeth, the crowns of my teeth weren't even formed yet. And so knowing what I know now, I thought, well, Gosh, most molars don't start developing facing in the right direction. They start developing in a rotated way. So maybe my teeth had a shot to erupt properly, but we just followed the advice of the surgeon, which could have been excellent advice. I don't know. Sure. But, yeah. but it kind of goes back to what you're saying about sometimes you feel like maybe there's some subjectivity to that. And yeah. uh, But to loop back around to your question, my parents, I don't think either of them had wisdom teeth taken out. I don't think any of my grandparents had wisdom teeth taken out. So what I'm trying to get at here is that I don't, I don't think it's so much an evolutionary problem in terms of our biology. I think it's an evolutionary problem in terms of our culture and our technology that's changed our diets. 
Interesting. Okay. And so in what ways let's, let's expand on that. Cause it seems like there's a lot of different factors at play there. Um, so culture and technology and how that impacts our diets. What do you mean by all that? So even today, there's some populations of contemporary modern humans that would be eating foods that are tough and really chewy and really hard. And they'd be eating these foods from a very young age because they just don't run to the shop and buy some Wonder Bread and some cheese in a can or a smoothie, you know, all these really soft foods that a lot of us start eating when we're quite young. And so that means that the people today who are eating tougher, harder foods from a really young age, like after they, you know, stop nursing and they start on solids, they're, they, they're triggering a biomechanical feedback where the jawbone is responding to force, basically. Just like, you know, a tennis player will develop um, a really strong muscle attachments on the arm that they're swinging the racket with. Mm, okay. So I think I think that's kind of what's going on here, at least in part, is that, OK, we evolved to have smaller jaws. That's fair. Um, but the, the extreme cases of wisdom tooth impaction that we're seeing are really recent, like just a few generations. And they're not seen across the world. They're seen in westernized populations that eat highly processed foods, pretty soft diets. And I think we're just not maxing out our jaw growth as much as we have the Mm -hmm. potential to do and that means that our wisdom teeth just kind of crash into um a space crunch and they can't yeah. yeah i mean that makes me think then like i wonder how different were diets of say our grandparents versus us today um because yeah i mean we never heard of, of them having you know wisdom teeth extracted um so it is interesting now how what to what to what extent then I wonder like is also um, just our ability to you know think of medical problems in a more advanced way also a, a major contributing factor where you know before dentistry wasn't so much concerned about it and then they over time through studies like hey you know these are things that can cause issues for people let's start to be more proactive at you know examining this type of stuff I think there's I guess there's multiple levels when it comes to dentistry, um, A, there's the advancement of technology and, you know, B, obviously just medicine in general advances, the new studies come out and the comp, you know, as more evidence is compiled, people make more decisions. Um, but at the same time, dentistry is also, you know, it's a little bit, it acts differently than the rest of the medical field and that, you know, medical field, it's, you're this hospital and there's like a big chain of command in terms of how things are processed. At a dentist, you're just working with the dentist in their you know, kind of private office. And so I feel like the opinions you can get can be uh, more, I guess there's more variation in opinions when it comes to some dental things and some medical things. Um, though I think the medical sphere in general does have variation in advice as, you know, science is complex, right? So people are gonna have different opinions. But it's interesting because I just feel like the, the way the dentist field of dentistry is set up, it's, it's just different than the rest of the medical sphere. And so the questions that you may be asking about, like uh, wisdom teeth removal, it seems like there's more of a debate on that and different and then other things going on, I guess, if that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, and, and thanks for raising that point because I find it fascinating. Again, this this is where I got interested in biological anthropology was this interface of our biology, the evolution of our biology and the evolution of our culture and how our culture influences our biology. And what you've described is exactly a culture of a medical profession that then influences how that profession, that medical profession and dental profession treats people's bodies. It's really interesting. Yeah. And we see these, these trends, right? Like people used to get their tonsils out on the regular. So like my dad told me the story about how everyone just got their, their tonsils out, got to eat ice cream for a week. It was great. It was just the thing that kids had done until there was work showing that, um, yeah, I guess tonsillectomies weren't necessary, prophylactic tonsillectomies, right? If you really need your tonsils out, fine. But if your tonsils are okay, leave them. And it was the same thing with appendectomies, right? Just get your appendix taken out because it could get infected and the consequences for that are very high. You could die. So no one wants to deal with that uncertainty. But now do we send kids for routine prophylactic appendectomies? No, right? Like I don't right. know anyone who's 
had their appendix taken out. Um, and, and that's great. <laughs> that's good. But with wisdom teeth, I think we're in a transitional period where it's uh, it's a part of your body and the surgical extraction is major oral surgery. It's usually done under some sort of anesthetic. It carries risks like any surgery. But where I think dental clinicians struggle is with the uncertainty piece because they don't want patients even later in life to suddenly have an abscess, a cyst, some sort of issue where now they have to do the surgery. And in their view, that surgery is even more problematic because like mm -hmm. with me, they took my wisdom teeth out when my wisdom teeth weren't even fully formed. So it was easier to get them out. Once you have fully formed wisdom teeth, you could make the case possibly that it's it takes more to get those teeth out. That could pause, you know, pose a higher risk to the patient. So I think it's that, you know, well, if we whip them out early when you're 17, then now we have a known quantity. Your teeth are gone, your wisdom teeth are gone. You won't have any problems. Now everyone can just proceed as normal. Um, but there's a lot of countries that now have a watch and wait recommendation or watchful waiting. And that's being adopted, I think, increasingly with dentists where they say, okay, you have impacted wisdom teeth, but are they creating a problem for you? Are yeah. you feeling any pain? You know, do we yeah. see anything in your x-ray that you get done every two years? If not, then we leave them. And if so, then we send you for an assessment with an oral surgeon. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of like, I guess what, what happened to me is I know I've had uh, several dentists who, you know, were not oral surgeons themselves, you know, say like, Hey, you know, we saw this on your x-ray. And I think I had a couple that had come in and I think maybe one of them is impacted. Um, but two others that never popped out. And so, I mean, it just kind of depends. Like I've had some dentists, uh, because I've moved around a bit. So I've had different dentists throughout my life and, you know, some were like, Oh, you know, there's different approaches. It seemed like, so you get also a little bit of taste like human psychology, a little bit where some were like, you know, oh, don't even need to look at your teeth. Like, oh, you have wisdom teeth, get them out. Um, while others have, you know, a different approach where they're like, oh, you know, you need to go to the oral surgeon and have this looked at. And um, I went to oral surgeon, you know, they say, well, you know, it, it may be useful to take them out, but it also may not <laughs> matter. <laughs> and so it's like, okay, so I can either, you know, get a voluntary surgery under the assumption that maybe something will happen um, or I can just wait, you know, if something happens, get them out. So for me, it's just like, well, I don't really, I'm not too keen on, you know, going under the knife for, for something, you know, potentially that may happen. And I think it's also just depends on, you know, what people are willing to, you know, to risk and, and just what your individual case is, it seems. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's such a, a fascinating thing. And I think what you're doing in your research is so interesting because it really brings, um, you know, kind of this history relevance aspect to modern dentistry, where you're looking at from an you know, evolutionary standpoint, and you know you're really connecting you know the past and present through your work, which I think is absolutely fascinating, and people should do more often because I feel like just going into the dentist every day, you know, for anyone out there knowing you know why something exists in their mouth and understanding the complexity of that. It's more comforting than going in there like, wait, what? I have wisdom teeth. What are those? Am I going to die? You know, what's happening? Um. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. No, I, I think it's great to be empowered with knowledge. I obviously find it really interesting. You find it really interesting. Thank you for the kind words about the, the work my lab's doing and our approach to it. And I just think it creates a richer understanding of yeah, exactly like you know, do, do I need to, to get my wisdom teeth out? Can I wait a while? What are these things? What are the implications? Uh, and I, I find I'm hearing more and more um, anecdotal stories where dentists are really just kind of putting it back into the, the patient's court instead of saying, oh, you've got to get these out. They say, okay, yeah. here's the situation. Now it's up to you what you want to do about it. And, and we'll go from there, which is great. It's great to empower people to make choices yeah. for themselves when it's their own bodies that are, you know, their focus. Yeah. I mean, I think also just for like the, the field of dentistry, I mean, I, I think it's, it, I think it empowers dentists also because I think then people sort of trust dentists more when I think the, the whole pressure approach, I know for, for some dentists I've had just my personal experience, 
uh, some kind of had an approach that it felt more like a, a car salesman almost than a, than a dentist. I'm like, you know, it just doesn't give me the right vibe. So I definitely have a dentist that, as I think with any medical issue, you know, it's a person's body and it's about explaining them, you know, their professional medical advice. Um, and then especially referring them to, you know, the surgeon or, you know, who's an expert, you know, with, with anything, if someone's going to do, I think a surgery, I think, especially if it's, if they're really concerned about, you know, the, the more people you get advice from the better, cause you want a consensus on you know, what to do with your body. You know, you don't want to go in there like, you know, first, first car you see, you're not buying off a lot, you know, when you're, when you're shopping for a car. Um, so yeah, I think it just, it, it helps both the patient and the, the field of dentistry and, and makes it uh, just a more sophisticated approach to complex issues that, you know, have life-changing consequences either way, whether you wait to get them out or you don't get them out, or if you get them out early when you never really need to get them out. Um, so it seems like it's moving in the right direction from what you're telling me. Yeah, I think it is. I think there's like, there's been discussion for at least a, a few decades now, um, probably two decades of intense discussion and reassessment with government policy shifting. And so, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think we'll see a trend towards, um, especially too, you know, dentists are trained in a certain way. And as the, um, the approaches shift with the next generations of dentists, then I think we'll see a culture change where maybe more dentists will be comfortable with the level of uncertainty around the teeth and will collaborate with their patients to make the right choice for that time. Yeah, it makes sense. So I guess we'll we'll see how things continue to to develop from here. Um, so you know, from your research, what would you say have been, uh, you know, kind of the the biggest surprises that you've learned over the course of your work? Whether it's it could you know wisdom teeth or something else um, that you also research. You know, what has really surprised you about you know human evolution and um, there's a lot, but I mean, from my lab, I guess we, uh, so I have a, a graduated PhD student named Denver Marchiori. So Dr. Denver Marchiori did this research on human wisdom tooth impaction and found that the earlier that your third molars start to form, the more likely they're going to erupt properly, which is hmm. neat, I think. That um, is interesting, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if I would have predicted that. I know that other people have floated the idea that if you have teeth that are forming earlier, then they're kind of claiming real estate in your jawbone and they're stimulate maybe stimulating jawbone growth so that there's they're almost creating room for themselves because it's that biomechanical feedback where you know something's in a bone, it responds to it biomechanically. Um, so I mean that's interesting because classically with wisdom tooth impaction, people would say, well, you don't have enough space in your jaw. Yeah. So that's, that's it, right? There's nothing there's, that's the main variable. And I'm not saying that's not a important factor because it definitely is, but it, it was interesting for us to go all the way back to even when your third molar hasn't even started to initiate or to start forming. And that that variable can also be used by clinicians to say, Oh, okay, well, on a bell chart or a, a bell plot, of, sorry, the word is a bell curve of, uh, of you know, kids who are developing their wisdom teeth, um, you tend to be on the earlier end. So, you know, you're probably actually gonna have teeth that come in okay, but it, so you go to your dentist and you're 14 or 15 and your wisdom teeth haven't even started yet or they've just started, then maybe your dentist has another indicator to help them decide, oh, okay, you know, maybe, we need to keep a closer watch on you because your wisdom teeth are at, at higher risk of yeah. getting impacted. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I mean, the I guess the more different uh, you know, aspects of it that you can bring into the equation to understand, you know, what's going on, the better. Then, um, is there a particular age uh, that they erupt? You said like the younger you are, like is there a, like a, a cutoff point? Like oh, if you get them when you're 16 or 17, it's better than if you know. 21 or what? Yeah, I, I wish I could tell you definitively. Um, it's just that we don't have a big enough sample yet. You'd have to get like a huge sample to really have a lot of power behind that sort of a predictive statement, which I would love to do, but we're not there right now. So um, usually eight, eight years old is kind of the earliest 
that I seen that, that not to erupt, but yeah. to start forming them. Okay. And okay. and the thing to also bear in mind is that the it's pretty linear, actually. Yeah. Like when you start forming a wisdom tooth, that means if you go earlier when it starts, it's going to erupt earlier. If you if your wisdom teeth start forming later, they're going to erupt later. So it's kind of like this, you know, one to one thing where if a kid starts developing wisdom teeth at age eight or nine, then maybe they'll erupt by, I mean, I'm just spitballing, it varies, but like age 15, 16. Okay. But, you know, um, if then you, you don't even see a sign of wisdom teeth until you go for an x-ray at your dentist at age 12 or 13, then we're looking into late teens, early 20s for those teeth to erupt. So, um, yeah, like, and the eruption stage can vary a lot, like the timing can vary a lot. So it's still, again, that's why it's harder to predict. That's why you need like a lot of people sample to be able to say, yeah, yeah. This, is, this is the cutoff. This is the threshold. That's interesting. Now, I'm curious then, thinking of other primates, um, have there been, has there been any evidence of shrinking jaws in other primates at all? I mean, perhaps primates held in captivity or something like that may more likely to have uh, a different diet to a certain extent or... Uh, you know, primates in a zoo. I don't know what what's yeah, going yeah, on yeah. there. Oh, that's that's excellent questions because there are there's other primates that have flatter faces. Um, what's really interesting is that not I have not found very many reports at all of wisdom tooth impaction in non-human primates. Okay. So it's it's hard to find. There are, I think are some cases of great apes. And baboons, baboons are interesting because you can see some kind of funky uh, problems with baboon teeth, but it's still pretty rare compared to humans. So we present with all kinds of dental problems, overcrowding, malocclusion, like where your teeth don't line up properly, uh, yeah. wisdom tooth impaction. We have our, you know, jaw joint, TMJ issues, and these things could be happening in the wild, but you know, for whatever's been documented, there's very little. And in zoos, yet, because that's, you know, you can definitely study those animals. There's still not a lot, but I think there is a higher incidence of dental problems if they're feeding um, primates soft foods, softer okay. foods. But I think they normally would give them kind of what they would eat in the in the wild. Like, I don't think they'd mess with their diet too Here's much. A Twinkie. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just give random things, yeah. I would hope the zoos are doing a better job, uh, yeah, sticking to uh, traditional diets for uh, animals, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm assuming monkey chow is sort of kind of like the, the texture that okay. would be fed in, you know, <laughs> in, in, the, in the wild environment and the savannas or the forest that these primates would be in. But it, it's what, what is interesting, I guess the take home message from your question is it is possible to see these sort of dental pathologies in non-human primates in either a zoo environment or a captive environment, and sometimes in the wild, but it's super rare, which indicates that humans are doing something particularly exceptional, that okay. we have so many dental problems so often in modern populations. Yeah. And and I believe you said earlier, it, it seems to be more prominent in the Western part of the world. So some aspect of what we're eating, uh, I guess we have softer food or something, or on average, that's interesting. As I was wondering, like, geez, what are we, what are we eating that is causing this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a culture of convenience, isn't it? It's yeah. just eat something really fast, drink something really fast, don't chew very much. Yeah, wow. Yep, it's, and you just mentioned also that, I guess, you know, that, and that's just one of the many dental issues that we have as a species since all the other uh, dental is issues with the structure of our teeth and our jaw, um, you know, all the braces that we're having to get for, you know, <laughs> all these weird things going on. So yeah, I guess our species just has lots of uh, problems when it comes to dental care. So Yeah, and I would say like our cultures, because they're, you know, I say, in you know, industrialized or westernized cultures, yeah. um, because we have this history of industrialization that happened kind of between the last 200-ish, 300-ish years. Sure. So that industrialization totally changed 
uh, our view on life, on our diets, on what we ate, because now things could be created in a factory and packaged in a factory. So again, if you go to other parts of the world where people aren't living a similar lifestyle to what we do here, their diets are different, at least in childhood, you won't necessarily see the same amount of dental problems that you would see if you go to Canada, if you go to the United States, if yeah. you, know, you go to parts of Europe, you know, that, that kind of thing. Is, is childhood like a crucial period then for dental development and uh, yeah. things form? Yeah, and, and it is. And, and truly, I mean, if you're going to make a difference in the ability of your wisdom teeth to erupt into the mouth properly, then you really want to be front loading uh, hard, chewy, tough foods in those early, you know, the early yeah. first decade of childhood, really, you want to stimulate jaw growth as much as you can. And uh, I mean, you can't control the timing of your wisdom tooth development. Uh, at least not at this point, we can't, but certainly you can control how, how, what you eat and how much that potentially could make your jaw grow. So what would you say are things that stimulate, uh, I guess, strong and sturdy jaw growth? Like what types of food? Like, are we talking about bubble gum? Are we talking like eating, you know, chewing on something that's hard, like a, like a stick or something, you know, <laughs> what, know. what are you thinking of here? Yeah. I think I think I should patent the stick, Ben, and we should yeah. all just chew sticks. Yeah, you know? I just feel like if you're really trying to stimulate it, you know, just get something hard and you just chew on it, yeah. eat it. But <laughs> I saw this video, this ad, sorry, this ad that came up on YouTube the other I don't know, a few months ago at least, and it was for this device that you put in your mouth. It was this kind of rubber device that you chew. Have you seen this? this no. Ad at what all? is that? What? I can't even remember what this thing was called, but it had a bunch of very beautiful fit people putting this, you know, rubber device into their faces <laughs> and then chewing on it and saying how it improved their, their neck muscle tone and their jawline wow. tone and all this stuff. And I thought, well, I don't know if I would go for that, but if you <laughs> gave, I don't know, something like that to a kid, I mean, I'm just spitballing. We would need to medically, you know, right. verify the device and all that Don't stuff. do this. Yeah. After listening to this, don't just go do yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> but, but chewing is important because even before a baby's born, its muscles are moving and it's contracting its mouth and making suckling motions and breastfeeding is also important for that. So that helps stimulate jaw growth because of the sucking motion that right. happens. So then I guess maybe chewing gum uh, has okay. an effect. I've yet maybe. to see a study yeah. <laughs> about have that. To, you have to work on that next in your lab, I guess. Yeah. So. <laughs> I need to hit up like Trident or something and yeah. get them to uh, collaborate maybe with gum me. for life too, maybe in the deal or, you know, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perks. Yeah. Wow. I also wonder if like, uh, I don't know who maybe study this, but uh, if people have noticed any difference in like, I don't know, dogs or cats with the food they eat, if it's softer than what they would, you know, naturally, of course they've been domesticated for thousands of years, but I just wonder if they, if they, uh, you know, have similar dental issues to people due to that domestication for so long and, and being given, you know, people, food, in industrialized countries and stuff like that. I don't know. Yeah, that's a really good question. I we we need to find a dog breeder who's willing to take yeah. like some of some puppies from a litter and give them hard dog chow versus soft dog yeah. food. <laughs> well, I guess happens. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I guess like I know veterinarians seem to be more concerned about teeth of of uh dogs and cats these days. Um I guess probably due to probably they live longer now and so they're more likely to have dental issues later in life. But uh yeah, it's interesting, although the wonderful world of dentistry and uh, all animals, I guess. So, <laughs> Yeah, it's true. And I know there are some breeds where there are veterinarian dentists who are particularly uh, yeah. concerned with or they're tricky because they, yeah, they have their teeth crowded in there and that can cause issues for the animal. Yeah, interesting. So where are you currently researching then? At the moment, we're looking at a series of genes, uh, a gene regulatory network, if you like, that we've identified that seems to allow teeth to evolve without changing the jaw skeleton. Huh. And <laughs> that's kind of a, a big deal because so many of the genes that are needed to grow a tooth 
are also needed to grow a jaw. So if you mess with one or more of those genes, you kind of mess with the whole face. And we see that with um, some more severe cases of congenital or birth defects in kids where there's certain genes that are just big player genes. And if they don't act properly, then you have a big issue. But the genes that we're looking at seem to allow teeth to do something different without impacting the face, which from an evolutionary perspective is really interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So that, yeah, I didn't think about that. Yeah. All the aspects there, like yeah, teeth and she's, I mean, it is fascinating just in general that people and you know, all animals really have teeth used for different types of things throughout your jaw. Um, I mean, I don't think people think about it much, but it is crazy to think all the different types of teeth a person has and, uh, you know, oh, this, it's like, a, like a toolkit kind of in your mouth almost. So. Yeah, absolutely. It is. And then actually if anyone ever gets a chance to look at even different, like if you go to a museum, right. And you see skulls of different mammals and you look at the teeth, there's like, if you look at a seal tooth, it looks like a leaf. It's really beautiful. And it has wow. this really completely different shape to if you look at even just a, a human molar and you can look at a, a panda tooth it looks really different as well so there are these different toolkits you're right these animals adapted to environments that included different foods and they they evolved teeth that allowed them to make the most of those niches those food supplies and uh and so how is that possible like wh where does that flexibility come in where again, you're not screwing up a whole animal's face just to have some change in the teeth so that you can eat something different. Right. And that's where I think this, this network of genes is, is cool because maybe this is a window into understanding how teeth can evolve differently without dragging the jaw skeleton with it. Yeah, I mean, do we know much um, right now about like, the differences in genes and how those impact the teeth of say, you know, people versus like Neanderthals or Denisovans or other species of hominids. I mean, I know that they've shown that, uh, you know, these species had uh, mixed with humans a bit and there, you know, some people will have some DNA from them. Um, any, any ideas about uh, sort of those differences and, and how could they impact things and people or just the differences between those two species? It's a wonderful question. I would secretly love to know that I have some Neanderthal DNA in me, you know, which yeah. would be so cool. <laughs> um, uh, but I think that with us and our close relations like that, because I mean, if they were interbreeding with what yeah. we think of as Homo sapiens and modern humans, then they were really close in terms of how they were growing their bodies, including their teeth. Yeah. So I, I think that based on some developmental biology research that's come out in, in the past years, it's more like a, a dial that gene expression dose can get turned up or turned down. And okay. that if you have X amount of this protein around at a certain time, then it's gonna create a molar that looks slightly more like you know this Neanderthal molar over here. Um, versus if you dial the, the expression up or down, then you could get what looks more like a modern uh, human molar over here. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's just kind of depends. It sounds like there's a, a spectrum then of, of how much uh, a gene can impact uh, a person's development then. Yeah, I think so. And we even see interesting cases with point mutations too. Like there are, uh, so third molars wisdom teeth are, Typically, if you're going to be missing a tooth altogether, it's often that's the wisdom tooth. But I don't know if you're missing any teeth. I'm missing one. I still have a baby molar in my mouth because one of my premolars never formed. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah. So I'm a mutant like that. I have this point mutation. There's some gene or genes that just didn't get expressed in that particular spot in my mouth. And my premolar never happened. So I have my wow. baby tooth. I think my sister actually... Uh, is missing several molars that just never came in. Um, so not fun for her, I guess, but uh, <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting to see how that happens. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, and I, I guess they give wisdom teeth, you know, some people have them all come in, others just have them that never come in or some 
people, I guess, are born without wisdom teeth. Um, so, yeah, a, a lot of variety, I guess, in, in the human species when it comes to teeth. Yeah, and I've even heard of people who have a third set of teeth. Like we have baby teeth and our adult yeah. teeth, right? That's what we think of. And then they had a third set come in which is really interesting because you think of a shark that's always replacing its teeth or a T-Rex that's always right. replacing its teeth. So that suggests that in these people, they had some sort of, I don't know, stem cell population in that part of the tissue that gives rise to the next generation of teeth that usually stops in most of us. But then in these people, it just didn't stop. It kept going. They got a third set of teeth out of it. Wow, I wonder like what's the origin of, of that gene, and and yeah, I mean that sounds pretty amazing and uh, probably handy if you're able to keep replacing your teeth like that. So, <laughs> right, yeah, and it's also really interesting because those people often didn't know, so there was no other indicator that they had extra teeth. Their faces looked normal; they felt just fine. Yeah. So again, here we have this instance where the human face is doing what it's doing, and then the teeth are like, "Well, I'm going to do something differently." And wow. I'm going to grow a third set of teeth just for kicks, you know? Wow. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Well, I mean, I guess there's just lots of uh, kind of anomalies when it comes to human beings and, and genes can, you know, present these unique traits that, you know, other most people don't have. Um, I guess it just shows how much we have to learn about human evolution. So <laughs> Teeth were a great window into it, that's for sure. Cool. Well, um, I guess, what would you say then is the best way for people to keep track of your research and your lab and what you're doing? Oh, thanks. Uh, well, I have a faculty page on the University of Saskatchewan website. So if you go to the Department of Anatomy, Physiology, and Pharmacology, then, you know, under faculty, I'm listed. I also have a Google Scholar page if people feel like dropping in there. And I am on the Twitter okay. at Evo Devo Anthro. So There you go. Okay, yeah. cool. All right. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all your interesting insights and knowledge. Uh, it's really cool. So, Thanks, Ben. It's really interesting to talk with you and, and get that kind of historian's perspective on it and just appreciate how our, our, our work, my lab's research is dovetailing with that kind of a framework for thinking yeah, about yeah. people. Definitely a lot of uh, connections at play there. So happy to contribute to, to the conversation because you had so many interesting things to say. So Oh yeah, no, same with you. Thanks so much. <laughs>